Okay, so in the United States, more than 260 million acres of forest have been clear cut for animal agriculture. Um, so because this deforestation causes habitat destruction, um, livestock raising is one of the leading factors in loss of biodiversity in a lot of areas. Um, and in certain places, it's one of the leading causes of species being listed as endangered. So it affects other types of animals other than farm animals. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about monoculture, and this is getting into what we were talking about before um, with the United States diet. Um, so according to the EPA, there were 72 million acres of corn and 72 million acres of soy harvested in 2000, and only 2 million acres of other vegetables. So 98% of that soy crop is fed to livestock and 40% of the corn crop. It's the single largest source of consumption of, of corn. Um, so because of the huge demand for corn and soy from factory farms and the resulting government subsidies of these crops, farmers can't afford to grow a variety of crops anymore. Um, so, you know, farmers have this choice of like, oh, the government will pay me to grow corn or soy, which will be fed to these livestock, or I can go on my own and not be subsidized and try to grow these other vegetables. Um, and so this is like the root, that's one of the main reasons that, um, say, Big Macs are cheaper than salads. Um, and again, if you, um, I don't have the specific statistics on it, but um, meat is really inefficient, so it takes a lot more protein to produce meat than you would if people were directly consuming that soy. And so a lot of people say, like, isn't it hypocritical for vegetarians <coughs> or vegans to eat all these soy products since soy is a monoculture and it's bad for the environment? But as you see here, 98% of that soy is being fed to livestock. There's 10 billion um, livestock raised every year in the United States. So if people were eating this soy, it wouldn't be a monoculture. You wouldn't need nearly as much of it. And you could use that land and that money, those subsidies, to grow other vegetables. And then people would have a much, much healthier, more varied diet. So corn production leads to more soil erosion than any other U.S. crop. When farmers in the Midwest abandoned crop rotations to grow exclusively corn and soy, the average soil erosion rose from 2.7 tons per acre to 19.7 tons annually. Lack of crop rotation also increases vulnerability to pests, necessitating higher pesticide use. More than 70% of the soy crop harvested in the U.S. is Monsanto's transgenic Roundup Ready soy. Um, so do you guys know about Monsanto? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're like one of the most evil companies of all time. Um, it's the earth. Yeah, pretty much. And so, mo like, a lot of people, pretty much everyone who knows about Monsanto would never knowingly go out and, like, support Monsanto or, like, buy their GMO products. But um, people don't realize that if you're eating animal products, you're eating GMO soy um, that the animals have eaten, and you're supporting Monsanto. Okay, so now we're going to move on to global warming. A 2006 report from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization revealed that animal agriculture accounts for 40% more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation sector combined. So livestock directly emit methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, that's one of the huge reasons that they contribute to global warming. Um, livestock actually account for more than a quarter of all global methane emissions, um, and methane is approximately 20 times more potent in warming the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. Um, and then in addition to the direct contribution of greenhouse gases, factory farming also consumes a lot of energy and fossil fuels. Um, so it takes tons of energy to power all of the machines on factory farms, um, the light and air filtration systems, all the conveyor belts, all that stuff, um, as well as the slaughterhouses and the processing plants. Um, and then there's all the transportation required um, to bring food to the animals and then the animals to auction and to slaughter and processing into the market. Um, and that's all done via trucking, so it's using, um, using gas. Because of all that, a recent study by the University of Chicago found that consuming no animal products is 50 times, or sorry, 50% more effective at fighting global warming than switching from a standard car to a hybrid. So a vegan driving a Hummer is actually doing more to stop global warming than an omnivore driving a Prius. Okay, um, so one of the main reasons that animal agriculture is so bad for the environment is poop. Um, a typical broiler chicken facility produces 6.6 .6 million pounds of manure every year. Typical pig factory farm, 7.2 million pounds. Typical cattle feedlot produces 344 million pounds of manure every single year. So altogether, farmed animals in the U.S. produce 130 times as much waste as the entire human population. Um, and yet there's almost no waste treatment infrastructure for farmed animals. There's no sewage pipes, no treatment, um, and there are very few federal guidelines regulating it. So imagine if every man, woman, and child just urinated and defecated into giant open-air pits all year round, and that's basically what you have on factory farms. Um, and it's not just poop, it's all of the antibiotics that the animals are fed, 
It's all the insecticides sprayed onto them. It's all the blood and vomit and refuse, like anything that will fit through those floors. So what happens to all that poop? Um, before factory farming, there was a natural cycle of reusing waste from animals to fertilize the crops that were being grown to feed to the animals. Um, but now with factory farming, there's far more waste than can be used for fertilizers. So at one point, three factory farms in North Carolina were producing more nitrogen than all of the crops in the entire state could absorb. Um, so as you can see here, the liquefied waste is pumped into lagoons adjacent to the buildings where the animals are kept. Um, so each of these barns has 9,000 pigs in it. Um, you can see there's like 9 or 10 barns here. Um, so all of their poop is pumped right here to this 20 million gallon manure lagoon. Um, and these lagoons can cover as much as 120,000 square feet and be as deep as 30 feet. Um, and there are often 100 or more of these cesspools in the vicinity of a single slaughterhouse. And you can see that here, there's a bunch of them in the background. Um, and there's also lots of issues of environmental racism to do with factory farming because um, the richer people always lobby to get these moved to the poorer areas. And so, I mean, there's horrible, horrible smells um, and like neurotoxins that uh, waft up from these manure lagoons. And so the communities around here are often just devastated and it's often um, the lower socioeconomic levels that are most impacted by Factory farms often purposely dump waste into public waterways. So conservative estimates by the EPA state that waste from factory farms has polluted 35,000 miles of river in 22 states. Um, and that's actually an old figure, so it's probably higher than that by now. In only three years, factory farm runoff has killed 13 million fish. So this picture that you see here um, is from the website of the Environmentally Concerned Citizens of South Central Michigan, and they focus on documenting factory farm pollution in their own backyards. So this picture is near Hudson, Michigan, and it's a confirmed case of illegal factory farm discharge. Um, the brown that you see here is manure, and the white that you see is an algae bloom. Um, so the algae, um, uh, the excess nitrogen and phosphorus in the manure causes the growth of all this algae, and it completely um, takes all of the oxygen out of the water, and that instantly kills all of the fish and just destroys the local ecosystem. Um, and the reason that there's so much pollution, um, 35,000 miles of river in 22 states, um, is that there's very little regulation, as I was just talking about, and there's even less punishment for these companies. Um, so it's a lot cheaper to just dump waste into public waterways and pay the fine than to actually develop like a comprehensive sewage system. Um, so to give you an idea, Smithfield, uh, the pork factory farmers, had 7,000 violations of the Clean Water Act in a single year. Um, they also had um, the largest um, uh, violation of the Clean Water Act, I guess. They, um, they dumped like thousands of pounds of manure into this river. Um, and they also like falsified and destroyed documents about it. Um, and so for that, they are actually fined $12 million, which was the largest fine of its kind, which seems like a lot, but their CEO made more than $12 million in stock options that year. And so you can see, like, it's basically just a slap on the wrist for these companies, and so they really have no incentive to develop better methods. So the bottom line of this presentation is that there are links that inevitably and powerfully unite every purchase in a supermarket and every order from a menu with agricultural policy. So every time you make a decision about food, you're farming by proxy. So if you're outraged by Smithfield's 7,000 violations of the Clean Water Act in a single year, don't buy Smithfield. If you're outraged by the horrible worker conditions at slaughterhouses or the fact that animals smarter than dogs are kept strapped to the floor, don't buy those products. Remember, the worker and animal conditions and the environmental and public health repercussions are all inextricably linked. So giving money to the industry promotes all of those problems. I have a quote from Jonathan Zafred Fowler's book, Eating Animals, which I drew a lot of this presentation from. Any plan that still involves funneling money to the factory farm won't end factory farming. How effective would the Montgomery bus boycott have been if the protesters had used the bus when it became inconvenient not to? How effective would a strike be if workers announced that they would go back to work as soon as it became difficult to strike? So the question is really, what do you want your money to support? Factory farms will continue to thrive and pollute and exploit workers as long as consumers are paying them to. It's really that simple. You're voting with your dollar. You're buying their products regardless of the conditions they're using. And so it's profitable for them. Why would they ever stop doing it? Why would conditions ever change? Um, so the upside of that is that you can take action just by buying and eating products that don't support this system. Um, as I said before, even if you are getting like sustainable animal products, you should consider cutting back um, because of all the environmental repercussions and workers and slaughterhouses, things like that. Um, remember, you don't have to label yourself as vegan to put um, soy milk in your cereal. 
you don't have to label yourself as vegetarian to order a veggie burger in a restaurant. Um, I think people often default to the non-vegan option just because they don't like personally label themselves as vegan. Um, but why not default to the more sustainable and humane choice whenever you have the option? Um, also, you know, don't think that it has to be all or nothing. Um, if you like just can't ever give up cheese, try giving up eggs and milk, or at least decreasing your consumption of them. Um, think how much more you can help animals by giving up all animal products except for cheese, rather than giving up on the whole idea because you can never be vegan. Um, if you're looking to only give up certain products, um, look at the practices behind them. So, you know, rather than just saying, like, I'm going to be vegetarian and not eat meat, or, like, um, if you're upset by animal cruelty, the worst products are actually eggs, milk, and pork. Um, but if you're upset by environmental pollution, the worst products are beef and lamb. Um, there are so many easy substitutions nowadays and so many vegan-friendly restaurants in Berkeley that it's really not hard to experiment with limiting your consumption. So, you know, try soy milk or almond milk or rice milk or hemp milk or oat milk in your cereal. Um, try making vegan baked goods instead of um, traditional ones. Hopefully, as you saw here, vegan baked goods can taste just delicious. Um, they're healthier, they're cheaper. A box of egg replacer costs like $6 and it's equivalent of like 200 eggs. Um, and they don't cause thousands of miles of river pollution and no calves were separated from their mothers in order to produce them. Um, there's a website, um, vegweb.com, which is a vegan recipe database. And so you just type in whatever you want to make and it will give you recipes for it. Um, and they have ratings and comments too, so you can see which ones are the most popular, what are good substitutions to make, things like that. Um, also, you know, one way to cut back is like to have one day a week where you're vegan. Um, I'll, I'll, I've presented a lot of co-ops and they've done a, a thing called a vegan challenge, which is where people go vegan for a week. Um, and that's a good way to just like really analyze what food you're consuming and like what substitutions you can easily make. Discover ton there's tons of products out there that you might not think to try if you're not really focusing on it. Um, so I'm going to have a sheet out later where you can like sign up if you want to do the vegan challenge. Um, I also have Vegan and Vegetarian Guides to Berkeley, which is put out by the Berkeley Organization for Animal Advocacy. Um, and that's a list of vegetarian and vegan friendly restaurants around here. Um, I also have a handout I made called Take a Step, which has, if you want to do further research, it has books and websites to visit, um, as well as my personal favorites for replacement items. Um, and there's coupons here too. So this, um, the field roast sausages and the yogurt were donated, um, and I have coupons for the yogurt if you guys like them. Feel free to take as many as you want. Um, so I know that boycotting animal products is difficult because they're so integral to our society, and they also just taste really good. So it's a lot easier to just enjoy them and ignore where they come from than to actually confront the impacts of their consumption. But consider this quote. Just how destructive does a culinary preference have to be before we decide to eat something else? If contributing to the suffering of billions of animals that live miserable lives and quite often die in horrific ways isn't motivating, what would be? If being the number one contributor to the most serious threat facing the planet, global warming, isn't enough, what is? And if you're tempted to put off these questions of conscience, to say not now, then when? So remember that every time you decide not to eat an animal product, you are taking action against one of the most destructive industries on the planet. I really think it's the easiest form of activism, too. You just have to incorporate compassionate and delicious choices into your everyday actions. You don't have to like go out and make signs and pick it or anything like that. Um, you can eat this like tasty soy yogurt. You can go to Cineholic, which is a vegan cinnamon roll place. It's on Oxford and Alston. It's across the street from campus. There's just there's tons of options out, th out there. Um, all right, so that is the end of the presentation, and I'm open for Q and A.